Good afternoon and welcome to the City Club of Portland's Friday Forum, Oregon's premier public affairs forum. I'm Jim Zarin, president of City Club, and I welcome you all. Those of you here at the Governor Hotel, and those of you listening on OPB radio and watching on cable television, we are glad you are with us for our program today, this Friday, the 17th of October, 2008. Now for our live audience, uh, if any of you have not already turned off your cell phones or other devices that make noise, please do so now. Today's program will feature Jeff Merkley, the Speaker of the Oregon House of Representatives and Democratic candidate for the United States Senate for Oregon. Representative Merkley will address City Club in a single chair debate because his opponent, incumbent Republican Senator Gordon Smith, declined to participate in a City Club debate with Representative Merkley. We are very pleased to have Representative Merkley with us today. Before proceeding with our program, I want to announce uh, and acknowledge the loss of a very long-term uh, member and supporter of City Club, uh, another great civic leader, Ned Look. Uh, Ned Look died last week. We'll have a, a more extensive tribute to him in the uh, interest of time at next week's Friday Forum. Uh, I also want to just make brief mention of the fact that uh, we have many, uh, had many important and focused uh, City Club programs this fall as part of our Making Sense Out of Election series, and we will have a couple more coming up right before the election and right after the election. And the last thing I want to say before we go to our, um, our program is that we're once again pleased to have the financial support of Friday Forum corporate sponsors, without whose generous financial support these City Club Friday Forums, including these uh, time-honored political uh, debates would not be possible. And the corporate sponsors for this quarter are AARP Oregon, Comcast, Three Mile Canyon Farms, and the law firm of Baron Lieben LLP. I ask us all to thank them for their support. <laughs> now, as mentioned, incumbent Senator Gordon Smith declined to be with us today. And although it's not unprecedented, it is exceedingly unusual that a candidate for political office in Oregon would decline a city club inv invitation to debate. Now for this reason, and because of the high office involved, uh, and so that there is no misunderstanding, I wanted to have our Friday Forum Program Committee Chair, uh, Melody Rose, explain to us how we ended up in this single chair debate format. Just briefly, Melody. Good afternoon. As Jim said, I'm Melody Rose and I chair the Friday Forum Committee here at Portland City Club. Late last summer, the Friday Forum Committee of the City Club of Portland invited both the Republican incumbent, United States Senator Gordon Smith, and his Democratic challenger, State Representative Jeff Merkley, to debate each other here. We offered the option of multiple dates and flexibility in the format within our long tradition of fair, open and carefully scripted City Club political candidate debates. While Senator Smith declined the club's invitation, Representative Merkley did not, did accept, excuse me. Long-standing City Club practice is to honor a candidate debate invitation that is accepted by the candidate. Consistent with that practice, Representative Merkley's acceptance of our invitation entitles him to appear today at a Friday Forum debate with or without his opponent. During our discussions with Senator Smith's representatives, we from the Friday Forum Committee made clear that the Senator's presence would be welcomed even at the last moment. That is why you see a second podium today on the dais. We regret Senator Smith's absence, but look forward to our discussion with Representative Merkley, who is here and ready to proceed. My committee has prepared probing and serious questions for our guest, just as we would have done with a true two-candidate debate. Thank you. Thank you, Melody. And I would like to move on to introduce the moderator of our debate. Our moderator is a uh, professor of political science at Lewis Clark College, has his PhD from the University of Chicago in political science. Uh, his areas of scholarly interest include public opinion, U.S. presidents and the media. He's the author of numerous works, including a forthcoming article about embedded reporters in the 2003 Iraq War and a book on the evolution of presidential polling. Uh, he is a resident of Lake Oswego uh, and recently became a political analyst along with Bill Lunch on OPB Radio, a self-described political junkie, jazz lover, and mediocre golfer. 
Uh, please help me w welcome today today's debate moderator, Dr. Robert Isinger. And Robert, unlike the last time you're here, why don't you come on up here? Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks all of you for coming. Uh, the program says I have 60 seconds to say whatever I want. I'm not going to do that. We're running a little late. Instead, I'm just going to run right into the debate format. This debate will have several sections. First, the candidate will give a five-minute opening statement. Following that opening statement, the candidate will respond to questions suggested in advance of this meeting by the City Club Friday Forum Committee and myself, though the Friday For Forum Committee itself had final say in choosing and editing these questions. The candidate will have two minutes to respond to those questions. On occasion, I may ask a follow-up question, and the candidate will again have two minutes to respond. The questions will be divided into several categories. Questions about foreign policy, questions about domestic policy, and more general questions. These are the only questions that will be asked today. There will be no questions from the floor. We will rely on the judgment of our distinguished panel of City Club members seated here below to decide whether or not the questions have indeed been answered by the candidate. If two or more of these members raise their cards indicating that they feel a question has not been answered, I will restate the question and they might feel that you know, this will provide an opportunity for the candidate to reply again. The candidate will then have one minute to clarify his response. On our panel today, we have Marge Kafori, Tom Cox, and David Barenberg. Our timekeeper today is once again Joe Sixta. Following the questions, the candidate will have a five-minute closing statement. Please be respectful of the candidate. Please turn off your cell phones, and please hold all applause until the end of the program. And now I introduce our candidate. Jeff Merkley earned an undergraduate degree from Stanford University and a master's degree in public policy from the Woodrow Wilson School at Princeton University. He then served as a national security analyst, first in the Pentagon and then in the Congressional Budget Office. After returning to Oregon, Mr. Merkley served as the local executive director for Habitat for Humanity and the director of housing development at Human Solutions and founded the People's Investment Opportunity Program to help low-income families save money to buy homes, attend colleges, and start businesses. Mr. Merkley also served as president of the World Affairs Council of Oregon, and in 1998, the voters in Portland's House District 47 elected him to the legislature, where he is now serving his fifth term. In 2003, Mr. Merkley was elected by fellow Democratic House members to the position of House Democratic Leader, and in 2006, he became the Speaker of the Oregon House of Representatives. It appears Mr. Merkley has already taken the uh, podium. Thank you, Mr. Merkley. Thank you very much for your introduction, Robert. It's a pleasure to be here. I want to start by introducing my wife, Mary, if, if she could stand. I think you probably all understand that the hardest job in a campaign is to be the spouse of the candidate. So I really appreciate her standing with me in this, uh, in this journey. I want to dive in by telling you that I'm a son of, of rural Oregon. My dad was a mill worker and a logger, always worked with his hands, but believed passionately in the American vision of opportunity. Indeed, he said to me, son, if you go through the doors of that schoolhouse and you study hard here in America, you can do and be just about anything. And that's really a vision of, of opportunity in our nation uh, that I believe in. And it's a vision that I seized. And one of the experiences I had was in high school, the chance to be an exchange student in West Africa, in a small, small town. I was 16 years old and was an incredible experience to be surrounded by folks struggling to earn enough to be able to buy food the next day. It certainly gave me a profound interest in international affairs, and it gave me a deep appreciation of the opportunities we have here in our nation. I went on to uh, be the first in my family to go to college, to study international affairs, to work in Mexico, to work in India, fully expected to do the type of work in the world that Mercy Corps does, headquartered here out of Oregon. But just when you have a plan, life comes along and changes things, 
And I had a concern, and that concern was the, the possible use of nuclear weapons blowing up the world as we know it. So I did something audacious. I applied to a presidential fellowship at the Pentagon in the Secretary of Defense's office, and you can envision the interview, generals and admirals and top civilians, and the first question came from a general who said, Jeff, I see here on your resume that you were an intern for Senator Hatfield, and he votes against all the defense appropriations. And then I see that you worked for the Quakers two summers in Latin America, and they have the peace testimony. Why would we ever hire you in the Secretary of Defense's office? And I thought that was a very good question. <laughs> and my, my response was that national security is so much broader than simply military power. It involves cultural understanding, it involves economic development, it involves diplomacy, and it's important to have people with a broader impression and experience in the world be part of the conversation. And to my surprise, I was hired. I spent uh, two years working on issues in the Secretary of Defense's office and then worked on strategic nuclear policy for Congress during the 1980s and hopefully contributed something to the conversation about stability in our nation. And wouldn't it be great to have a U.S. Senator with enough background in national security to help distinguish between real threats to national security and manufactured threats to national security? Well, I came back home here to Oregon, and I headed Habitat for Humanity, and I started empowerment programs for low-income families. And then 10 years ago, I ran for the legislature because I believed that our education system was not up to par. In fact, was in worse shape than when I went to school. And how is it after a generation that could be the case? And I served a number of years and became very frustrated. I was frustrated that the Oregon House was paralyzed, and we were making no progress. So I talked to my wife, Mary, and said, you know, I'd like to resign my paid job and just dive in and try to do something about this, and she backed me up on that. And for four years, I worked to create a progressive pro-education, pro-health care majority, and we succeeded. And I became speaker in 2007, and we had the most productive session in a generation. And we kicked out payday loan sharks, and we invested in education and health care, and we established civil rights, and we put Oregon on the forefront of the green energy economy. We did a lot of good, but here's the thing. How far can Oregon go if our nation is off track? And just as the House was paralyzed here in Oregon five years ago, so is the U.S. Senate today. And just as I wasn't willing to give up on Oregon five years ago, I'm not willing to give up on the United States of America today. We need two senators fighting for health care and two fighting for energy, a smart energy policy, and two fighting to end this war in Iraq and bring our sons and daughters home, and two fighting to create living wage jobs and certainly two who are fighting to restore the integrity of the United States of America at home and abroad. So that's why I'm running for the U.S. Senate, and that's why I'm asking for your support, and I thank you very, very much. We, we now move to the portion of the program where I ask a few questions. Uh, these first questions relate to the subject of foreign policy. The candidate will have two minutes to respond to each question. The candidate has not seen these questions in advance. Uh, the first question is a multi-part question. Should the United States acknowledge and accept a continuing obligation to Iraq because of the massive destabilization, destruction, and death that our involvement there has caused? If so, what should be the nature of that obligation, financial aid, a military presence, or something else? And what, if anything, does Iraq owe us for toppling Saddam Hussein? You know, the, uh, this war in Iraq should never have been authorized, should never have been fought. That's why I wrote an article two months before the war and said, that in this situation, we should be dropping in diplomats, not dropping bombs. Unfortunately, we went into this war and we took our eyes off of the real terrorist Al-Qaeda threat in Afghanistan. And now we're in a terrible situation. And I've been calling to bring our sons and daughters home because they are the wrong folks to be monitoring checkpoints. We do not speak the language. We do not understand the culture. They're the wrong team to be on patrol. And here is the thing, that we need to have a president who will work very hard to have a firm schedule for withdrawal, and we need a U.S. Senate to back up that president. 
Now, upon withdrawal, we do have an obligation to assist Iraq. But Iraq has an obligation to assist itself as well. We should help with the reconstruction of the country, but we should do it through Iraqi contractors, building the economy, building the expertise, and building the future of the nation. And while we participate in that reconstruction, Iraq, which has now compiled substantial reserves from its oil revenue, should participate very heavily as well. Meanwhile, we should work with the nations surrounding Iraq uh, to uh, try to make sure that we don't end up with a broader war. We need to continue to be deeply invested in this region. We certainly need to be deeply engaged diplomatically. The next question. Afghanistan appears to be a sinking into a deeper and more dangerous period with bombings, deaths, and general terrorism increasing and with a limited Western presence on the ground. Afghanistan's neighbor, Pakistan, continues to harbor Taliban insurgents while receiving more than $11 billion from, from the United States since 2001 to eliminate the Taliban. How would you bring stability to that region? Going forward, what should our diplomatic position be with Pakistan? Well, the situation is uh, very disheartening in Afghanistan. It is the result of not having clear objectives and of taking our eye off the ball with our Im immersion in, in, a, in Iraq. And certainly here is the thing, that the, uh, the primary threat in Afghanistan is Al-Qaeda located in the mountains between Afghanistan and Pakistan. We should be very clear not to have, to have very limited, clear objectives that are supported by the Joint Chiefs of Staff, not trying to be doing all things in all places. It's important to keep in mind that the traditional nickname for the President of Afghanistan is the Mayor of Kabul, because you have essentially in Afghanistan a series of tribal chiefs who control their area of the country, and the, ex the extended influence of, of the President and the central government is very modest. In Pakistan, we made an enormous mistake. We basically backed a strongman at the expense of supporting diplomatic institutions. And we made another mistake. We invested enormous amounts of sum in that country, enormous sums of money in that, in that country that were invested in building up the military, not in building up the economy or the infrastructure or supporting the ordinary people in, Afghanistan, in Pakistan to have a better life. So we certainly need to be engaged with the democracy emerging in Pakistan. We need to be engaged with the, the primary amount of the majority of our aid going to assist the country uh, in terms of its uh, civilian conditions in education and health care and transportation. Uh, so those are the, the recommendations I would have as we go, go forward working with the reestablished democracy in Pakistan. Question number three, the politics of oil already shape and define many arguments or concessions between countries. As natural resources such as oil, water, arable land, and minerals become scarce and precious, international disputes over those assets are bound to escalate to dangerous levels. Like other nations, we are rich in some resources and lacking in many others. How can more than 190 of the world's countries collectively avoid engaging in resource wars, or are they inevitable? You know, when it comes to oil and energy, we are deeply off track. We have an energy strategy in this country right now that was written by Dick Cheney and the oil companies. It was rubber stamped by Gordon Smith, and it is absolutely the wrong strategy unless you happen to be an oil company. Now, over the, the past Eight years, the oil companies have produced $600 billion in profits. That's $2,000 from every pocket in America. That's what the oil companies have gotten. What we've gotten is $4 at the gas pump. And what we've also gotten is a policy that depends on foreign oil. And that's a huge mistake for our national security to be dependent just upon a few countries. And we have gotten an energy policy that results in us spending $2,000, 2000 I wish it was only $2,000, 2 billion a day on overseas oil. It's the biggest wealth transfer out of our nation we've ever seen. And what we've gotten is an energy policy that continues to burn carbon rather than investing in alternative energy. 
So we have to take this energy policy written by Dick Cheney and the oil companies, throw it out the door, and have very much a policy aimed at energy independence and aimed at creating renewable energy here in America. And what is good for our foreign policy and our economy is great also for Oregon because we have wind and wave and geothermal and solar and also the possibility of biofuels in terms of cellulosic ethanol. And so we should put America on the forefront of this green economy, just as I work to do as the Speaker of the House to put Oregon on the forefront. We should continue that effort and we need to put America on the world forefront, selling these technologies to the world, selling the products to the world, and tackling global warming. Uh, seeing that the question has not been answered according to our City Club uh, team, let me uh, not repeat the preamble, but repeat the question. Uh, are resource wars inevitable? Uh, resource wars is a, is a dramatic term for competition for scarce resources. Absolutely, there is going to be intense competition for resources. The number of humans occupying this beautiful blue-green planet is going up. Uh, we certainly uh, have concerns that range not just from energy, but to water, to food scarcity. But we can greatly modify that competition by recognizing that as a group of international countries, we have a lot in common and we should be working together to tack issues, issues of energy, issues of food, and certainly issues of water. Next question, from North Korea, Russia, Iran, and Pakistan to Afghanistan, Iraq, and Venezuela, the United States is juggling many dangerous foreign policy challenges. How do we pick our international battles? What criteria should the Congress use to determine where we should intervene and where we should not? In other words, how would you characterize your foreign policy doctrine? Well, you know, I think that there are two overwhelming issues right now in terms of national security. Uh, one is terrorism, and the point there is to focus on al-Qaeda and work with the international community. We have destroyed many of our relationships in the world that are critical to effectively taking on uh, terrorism. We certainly need to increase and improve uh, our ability in human intelligence and uh, international cooperation. A uh, second is nuclear proliferation. Now recognize we have many nuclear powers in the world and the club is growing. Uh, Pakistan is a nuclear power and has a fragile, new, newly restored democracy. Uh, North Korea is a nuclear power uh, and is uh, an unusual uh, government, uh, 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 dangerous government. We certainly have Iran seeking to establish nuclear weapons. Uh, that is a very big concern. So these are the two largest concerns. But I might add a third, and that goes back to the question about energy and competition for petroleum. It is competition for petroleum that helped to uh, put us into uh, the Iraq war under the calculation of, of the miscalculation of President Bush and his team. And it also goes to show uh, how energy independence is a key national security objective uh, for, our, for our nation. I repeat the question, and let me again uh, avoid the preamble. What are your criteria for international intervention? Uh, the key criteria for national security is certainly a direct threat to the United States of America. And this is the type of direct threat posed by terrorism and that is, is posed by nuclear proliferation. The U.S. should also be engaged in the world on issues that are not an immediate national security threat, but represent long-term interests of our nation. And certainly those long-term interests include establishing good relationships uh, and also uh, key issues such as uh, uh, when genocide is occurring or, or terrible abuse is occurring. We have a humanitarian interest to be engaged. So threats to national security and humanitarian engagement. We now move to the subject of domestic policy. There's plenty of blame to share about the forces contributing to our deteriorating economy. In your opinion, has the $700 billion fix 
accurately targeted the deep fundamentals of the United States economy, or has it just addressed superficial and obvious excesses without getting at the root of our economic problems? Related to that, would you have voted with Congressman Peter DeFazio against the bailout? The $700 billion bailout was a poorly designed policy that I would have voted against. And let me explain several things. This, this meltdown on Wall Street begins on Main Street. It begins with a conflict of interest in which mortgage brokers are paid by a lender to help steer a borrower into an expensive loan, an expensive loan for the borrower, not in their interest. We have to resolve that conflict of interest and absolutely end any secret steering payments that have led to two-thirds of our families that are in subprime loans would have been eligible for a prime loan that would put a much better financial foundation under the family. These loans were then packaged on Wall Street and then sliced and diced with different features and resold, and resold in packages with insurance attached. And this insurance, the credit default swap term is used for that insurance, was basically a bogus market. It was completely unregulated. So to restore confidence, we need to do several things. The first is that we need to end the secret steering payments that create a conflict of interest in retail mortgages. The second is that we need to restore oversight of Wall Street and strengthen the Securities Exchange Commission. The third is we need to absolutely regulate the unregulated market in, in the credit default swaps. And then in addition, we need to take and make sure that there is sufficient oversight of the Treasury Secretary. The Treasury Secretary should not be a one-man force with a $700 billion check. Furthermore, the premise of buying toxic mortgages was ill-conceived. If they're bought at value, they do not strengthen the balance sheets of the institutions. If they're more than value is paid, then basically uh, we are subsidizing the companies at the expense of the taxpayer. So much better approach to is invest in the st institutions uh, through preferred stock. Depending on your point of view, Congress adopted either a rescue plan or a bailout. Either way, what is the tipping point where personal responsibility ends and national obligation begins? How far should Congress go to rescue people and corporations for their own reckless and selfish financial decisions? You know, uh, what we need to understand is that many citizens are ready to take responsibility. For example, I got a call from a friend who said, Jeff, you know what? Two years ago, I went to a mortgage broker. He suggested to me that I take this mortgage. Later turned out it's a subprime mortgage that's going up in, in expense enormously after two years. Uh, I'm going to pay a lot more in interest, and the fact is I'm probably going to lose my house and be starting over. He said, I should have known better, but that's where I am right now. Well, perhaps he should have known better, but what he did not understand, and most families did not understand, is that the mortgage brokers themselves were being paid by the lender to steer their clients into these bad loans. So there is an institutional responsibility that we allowed this conflict of interest to exist. And I, so I think the tipping point is at two levels. The first is when you have a liquidity crisis threatening the markets, prompt and significant intervention is merited. And certainly that is, that is uh, uh, the point that we are at right now. The question is what form of intervention? And I've advocated for direct intervention with the institutions. But in addition, I think we need to reform the problems that led to this and there should be a way to facilitate those who are in subprime mortgages, who are steered into those mortgages, who would be much, would be able to make payments on a regular 30-year prime mortgage to be able to get such a stabilizing mortgage as a replacement. The family is stronger, the financial institution is stronger, and we'll go forward together with a much better economy. A, a quick follow-up on that, and that is, given your previous answer, where you would have voted against it, your criteria suggests promptness, but having voted, saying you would, you would vote against it, promptness now is delayed. Could you explain the potential paradox of the need for prompt action, recognizing that Congress might not adopt what one person might wish? 
You bet. Uh, this package was not about promptness because it involves having to hire consultants who have to assess all of the details of the toxic mortgages. You have to set up conflict of interest rules. And indeed, the administration itself said it would take probably close to two months before it bought a single toxic mortgage. Furthermore, there's absolutely no reason that a few sentences couldn't have been added to this bill to end those secret steering payments. That would have not have delayed this bill one moment. There is no reason that a page couldn't have been added to this bill to restore oversight of Wall Street. It would not have delayed the bill one moment. And so indeed, in this case, there was not a contest between promptness and doing the bill right. And in fact, what we ended up with the wrong bill that probably took too long to put forward. Our next question. Any politician entering the murky, dangerous, and divisive debate on how to provide health care to America's citizens does so at his or her peril. Some solutions are damned as, quote, socialized medicine, unquote, while others are dismissed as a sellout to the private sector. If you could craft the perfect health care program for our country's citizens, what would it look like and how would you pay for it? You know, uh, my top health care advisor is my wife, Mary, who is a nurse. And I think that it's so important to have legislators, to have senators who turn to those on the front line of medicine to be able to talk about the issues that we, we face. Not to have senators who turn to insurance companies and drug companies and ask the question, how can I make you more money? I want to know how we can have better health care for our families. And if I was to craft the best plan uh, right now, it would consist of the following. It would start with Senator Wyden's Healthy Americans Act, which fills and use it to fill in between those who don't have health care currently, providing an affordable, portable, comprehensive plan equal to what members of Congress have. But then, I would say we must become more cost effective. And that means we need to invest in prevention. And we need to invest in disease management. We need to invest in clinics that are on the front line of, of health care, because study after study shows we get so much more out of those clinics. We would have a statewide nursing line in every state, like we had in the Children's Initiative. So every parent could call up and say, here's what's going on with my child or my partner or my family member, and should I get them in to the hospital or get them into a doctor, and where? How do I get them in to the front door of the health care care clinic? And we should adopt uh, Governor Kitzhaber's ideas about evidence-based practices. Because we're spending 18% of our GDP on health care, more than any nation in the world. 10% is spent in Europe. Less is spent in Canada. So we're spending plenty, but we're not spending it smartly. So that is the plan that I would lay out and fight for as a U.S. Senator. Your, your support subsidies for cellulosic ethanol, which is made from non-food high cellulose products like uh, switch uh, switchgrass or wood. Traditional corn-based ethanol requires 29% more fossil energy to produce than it yields. Cellulosic ethanol might need 50% more energy to make than it delivers. In other words, both corn-based and cellulose-based ethanol products could take significantly more energy to make than they deliver. Why should the United States government continue to subsidize heavily these products? when they essentially constitute a net energy loss. You know, we need to discriminate between different types of ethanol. Let's start with corn-based ethanol. Uh, corn-based ethanol is an absolute loser. It uses more energy to make it than it produces. It raises the cost of, of food. It's resulting in the destruction of additional uh, ac acreage of uh, forests and jungles to produce, produce food. It makes, it's a mistake in every direction. Now, cellulosic ethanol has a much more promising future because, unlike with corn, the product is always already being grown in our woods. The question is, is there a cost-effective way to make ethanol out of this fiber? And the challenge is that the walls of the plant cell trap the sugars. And right now, and the reason for your question, is that it, we are using heat and pressure to try to break those cell walls and get at the sugar. 
But there is a lot of research going on in the United States trying to find alternative ways, trying to use enzymes to get through those cell, cell walls. And this is why we should be investing heavily in the research and development end of cellulosic ethanol. Because if we can find a cheap way to get through the cell wall, now we have an incredible product. As uh, some have put it, Oregon's forests could uh, not only be thinned to create more jobs and, and better fire conditions, but they could become a feedstock, uh, making Oregon the Middle East of cellulosic ethanol. We now move to questions about more general policies. The Department of Homeland Security, created by the George Bush administration, has become one of the larger agencies in the federal government system. It is viewed either as successful in preventing new terrorist attacks on United States soil or ineffective in responding to natural disasters in New Orleans, Houston, and elsewhere. What would you do with this department? How would you, if at all, restructure it? And what would you change, uh, what would you, and what would you charge to accomplish? What would you want it to do? You know, the Department of uh, Homeland Security um, takes on important national security issues. But my concern about much of, much of the management of the Bush administration, it has been essentially, if you think of that politician who runs for office and says, you know what, government just doesn't work. Elect me and I will show you. <laughs> well, the fact is we need to have an administration that believes in the power of tackling problems so that Instead of appointing somebody to head an agency who has no expertise, we're appointing people who have expertise, who are going to make that administration, that, that team, do the best possible job, make maximum, most effective use of our tax dollars. And I think whether we're looking at FEMA or whether we're looking at the Department of Homeland Security, uh, we need to have that kind of focus. And one of the issues that we need to tackle with the Department of Homeland Security is our port security, which is, of course, we here in Portland, it is a port. We have ports all over this country, and yet we are way behind in monitoring the cargo traffic that comes in uh, that could be a significant, significant risk. And we have to uh, re-ask the question, uh, what would you do with the Department of Homeland Security? Uh, what would you do if at all to restructure it? And what would you charge it to accomplish? I would restructure the Department of Homeland Security uh, to tackle the issue of port security and to tackle real issues of challenges, uh, terrorist challenges to the United States of America. If the United States and the rest of the world sink into a serious economic depression, what policies and actions will you advocate to restore a sound worldwide economic picture and to rebuild confidence in the fundamentals of the world's economic system? You know, there's a significant risk of our international economy uh, taking a further downturn. And it's a result of the deregulation of the Bush administration that has been so passionately supported by Gordon Smith. We deregulated the mortgages to the great harm of our citizens, and we deregulated Wall Street to the complete uh, damaging of our international financial institutions. What we need to do if we sink into a recession, and even if we sink further, we need to take and put this nation back on track economically. First, we need to end the subsidies that ship our jobs overseas. Gordon and Smith and I differ on this. He supports tax giveaways that subsidize the construction and operation of foreign factories. That's shooting ourselves in the foot. It makes no sense. In fact, it's an insult that our tax funds are used in this manner. We need to end that because we need to create living wage jobs here, which brings me to the green economy and the need for us to invest in being on the forefront of solar and wind and wave and geothermal, to be doing research on cellulosic ethanol so we can create jobs and technology here in America rather than shipping $2 billion a day overseas. The third thing we need to do is to close the tax giveaways to the wealthiest Americans and the most powerful special interests. Those giveaways uh, bankrupted our, our nation, uh, turned a surplus at the Clinton administration into an immediate 
uh, deficit of the Bush administration, and we've doubled our debt in the last eight years, and that is simply wrong. And then we need to invest in the infrastructure of this nation because that is so much more effective than any other type of stimulus. It creates regular jobs and creates an infrastructure that will serve this nation well into the next generation. We, I'll ask, re-ask the question, if the United States and the rest of the world were sink into a serious economic depression, what policies and actions would you advocate to restore a sound worldwide economic picture? Those policies include the following. The first is that we end the tax giveaways that have bankrupted our treasury. The second is that we invest in the reconstruction of our infrastructure. The third is we put the United States on the forefront of green energy economy. And the, the fourth is we end the tax giveaways that are shipping our jobs overseas. Next question. The current administration's economic policy appears to have been built on a belief that cutting taxes might pump more money into the economy. You seem to have embraced that philosophy by calling on more tax reductions for the middle class. Aren't you simply promoting more tax cuts without explaining how you would pay for them? Well, actually, I've explained very clearly how I'm paying for them, so the answer is no. We're going to, to pay for those tax cuts for the middle class by ending the giveaways to the most powerful special interests and the richest Americans. Those are the tax cuts that went to people earning more than $250,000 a year. Those are the tax cuts like the quarter trillion dollar giveaway that Gordon Smith gave to international corporations. You know, Gordon likes to say that the most important accomplishment he has made in his political career was a $265 billion giveaway to international corporations. Now, I'll tell you, I have a different philosophy and the, the head of the Council of Economic Advisors for Bush said, you know, we would have created more jobs if we had just dumped money out of a plane in America than if we adopted Gordon Smith's giveaway because those funds went overseas. But we should have used those funds here to fund a middle tax cut. I've argued for a working American tax cut. I've supported Barack Obama's tax cut that takes and helps families take on the price of college. You know that we are the first generation in America in which our children are getting less education than we are? That is a national tragedy, and we have to reverse that. So we need to invest in education, but it's through those, ending those giveaways through which we would pay for this. By ending those giveaways, the most powerful corporations and the wealthiest Americans. A, f a quick follow-up. Your answer is contingent on a filibuster-proof Senate. If the Democrats did not receive 60 or more votes, would you modify your tax cut proposals? Well, I would argue it doesn't depend upon a filibuster-proof Senate. Uh, in the Oregon House, I had just a one-vote majority. Now, we had a 12-point roadmap for Oregon and Opportunity. And it wasn't a roadmap about Democrats. It wasn't a roadmap about Republicans. It was a roadmap about solving problems. And our families, no matter where they are in the state, they are very concerned about a living wage job. They're very concerned about access to health care and the cost of housing. And they're certainly very concerned about a quality education uh, for their children. And so I cultivated a problem-solving mentality. And I reached out to, to bring the, the minority in, to bring the Republicans into the conversation. In fact, I did something that I don't think has been done anywhere else in the country as far as we can find, and that is I created teamwork bills. If two Democrats and two Republicans were the chief sponsors of a bill, that bill uh, was given an automatic public hearing, which is a very, very positive way to bring people together. And we need that same mentality in the U.S. Senate. And now the last question before the closing statement. The last question. In the second presidential debate, both candidates were asked to name specifically what sacrifices they would ask of the American people. Both candidates spoke about sacrifice in general terms, but did not specify how citizens help. If you were elected, what specific sacrifices would you ask for? You know, I. I'm reminded of, of one of the things that we face as a, as a nation right now, which is this enormous, enormous $10 trillion debt. And uh, when we went to, 
to uh, war in Iraq. Uh, the president didn't come out and say, help us fund this, buy savings bonds. Uh, he came out and said, please spend more and keep this economy afloat. The result is today that we have a, a debt of consumer and governmental debt that is three and a half times our gross domestic product. It's like a family earning $60,000 a year that takes out $210,000 on credit cards. That's why we were so close to the financial cliff when the meltdown on Wall Street occurred. And so I would certainly say to the American people, and I would encourage our president to say this, that this is a time in which we need to recognize that we have floated this economy on consumer debt for far too long, and we need to end our debt in which we are borrowing from Saudi Arabia and China and creating a debt that must be repaid by our children. And I would encourage families to restore the ethic of buying family savings bonds. And I would encourage our government to say, absolutely, we are going to cut back on key programs. And key programs that, gov that Smith has advocated for, the giveaways, the most powerful, and to the richest Americans. I'm going to say, you know what? We need fair taxation. And those who are best off among us, those earning more than $250,000, are going to now have to pay their fair share of taxes, as they did during the Clinton administration before President Bush came in. As for our working families, they are already sacrificing. Their wages are stagnant while the cost of everything else is going up and we need to be helping them. We now move to the final portion of the program, a five-minute closing statement. Speaker Merkley, your closing statement. Thank you so much for having me here today. I believe that all of you in this room and all of you listening in are doing so because you believe that we can build a better America, better on health care, better on education, certainly better on creating living wage jobs. I'm running for the U.S. Senate because I agree with you. We can do much better. And to put this nation back on track and do better, we need to change the U.S. Senate. And to change the Senate, we need to change senators. We cannot continue on the course that Gordon Smith and George Bush have set. We have a $10 trillion debt. We are mired in war. Our living wage jobs are being shipped overseas. And now we have this massive Wall Street meltdown. Now these conditions are having a huge impact on families across the state. And on my 100 town tour for change, I've heard from families in every corner of Oregon. My very first stop in Myrtle Creek, a woman talked to me about how the cost of prescription drugs was busting her modest monthly budget. So I mentioned I had a childhood friend who talked to me about the subprime impact, mortgage, impacting his family. And I had three men from Freightliner, Michael Wood and Bill McWirt and Morris Price, who said, Jeff, our jobs, our living wage jobs, have just been shipped to Mexico, and we're not sure how we're going to have a foundation for our family without a living wage job and good benefits. And citizens everywhere, everywhere, are now worried about their declining pensions or the declining IRAs and wondering if this meltdown that's coming is going to take away their jobs. We need a senator who will fight for our working families, who will partner with Ron Wyden. And Senator Smith is not that senator. He has voted with George Bush 90 percent of the time and he has backed every mistaken initiative of the Bush administration. And now he says he should not be held accountable for his support for these failed policies. He also is not a senator who's there fighting for working families. Now, 12 years ago, when he was running, he said, you know what? I'm going to fight for the minimum wage. But he didn't. He voted against the minimum wage 10 times. He said 12 years ago that he'd fight to create jobs for our families. He has presided over the biggest shipment of living wage jobs, and he has supported the policies that shipped those jobs overseas. And he has said, that the biggest accomplishment was his $265 billion giveaway, such a giveaway to international corporations. One company, Pfizer, got $11 billion. And I simply ask the question, wouldn't that quarter trillion dollars have been better invested in health care, in education, in recreating the infrastructure of this nation to support a quality of life for our working families? We need a senator who will fight for working families in every part of the state. 
whether there is a D after their name or an R after their name, whether they live in a small town on the coast or in central Oregon or eastern Oregon or southern Oregon or in the valley, wherever they are, they're concerned about the same core issues, a living wage job, a quality education for their children, affordable health care and affordable housing. I want to close with a story about my children, Brendan and Jonathan. They were learning to play basketball a few years ago in the front driveway and we'd lowered down the hoop so Brendan could get the ball up and in and uh, they were playing horse where if you miss it's the other child's turn to pick a shot and shoot. And so Jonathan missed and it was Brynn's turn and she was about seven years old and uh, she shot and she missed but instead of giving the ball back to Jonathan she grabbed the ball and she said that was a mess up, it doesn't count. And then Jonathan, nice older brother, let her shoot again, she shot again. She missed a second time and she grabbed the ball and said that was a mess up, it doesn't count. And with a little less patience Jonathan let her shoot a third time, and she saw it a third time. She missed again, and she said, that was a mess up, it doesn't count. But this time, Jonathan did not give her the ball back. He turned to her with all the wisdom of two additional years on this planet and said, Bryn, it works like this. You only get so many mess ups, and then it's someone else's turn. <laughs> that is why. That is why it is no longer going to be George Bush in office. And that is why it is time to retire Gordon Smith from office. It is our turn, your turn, for us to put this nation back on track to make it work for working Americans again. Thank you. Uh, this is a debate about uh, who's going to represent Oregon in the United States Senate. It's an important uh, office, not only for the state of Oregon, but for the country. We have two candidates. One of them was here today. One of them was not. On, on behalf of the City Club, I'd like us all to thank the one that was here. So. And without... Uh, Without commenting on the merits of his responses, I would like to comment on the questions. I'm just glad that I didn't have to, I mean, I don't, the questions were amazing. I trust you all agree. Uh, I'd also like to thank uh, our true squad, Marge Kafori, David Berenberg, and Tom Cox, our parliamentarian, Jonathan Rodmacher, our timekeeper, Joe Sixta, uh, Robert Isinger, our great moderator, once again. We'll see you at 12.15, the regular time next week, uh, when, uh, we have a debate on ballot measure 58 to require English immersion courses in Oregon public schools. We're adjourned. Thank you very much.